Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, soon we shall meet the cast. Observe them well, see if they are not yourselves. And if you find none of them to be so, then insert yourself into this review, for such it is. A review of things human, a view of things past. A vision of a world no longer in existence, a city among cities gone down in fire. For the world will no longer exist after this day. The cast. These are some of my friends. I knew them well. They all have stories. We shall be able to learn a little about each of them before our time runs out. These people have lives they are all immersed in. But we see that they had best lie down and make themselves as peaceful as possible, if they only knew. But they do not know. They do not know that it is to be today. Next year, they think. Next week. Tomorrow, later. But it is later than they think. They should not make life so complicated for themselves now that they have brought about their own destruction. But they cannot avoid the complexities, or death is their only alternative. Enough for now. Let us visit our first friend on his last day. My dear friends, he was simply running. Needing his friends, he had used them too much. Demanding more, he was told to go. Suddenly he saw them as masks, leering at him in his ugliness and his loneliness. Suddenly, he wanted to run away from all of them. Now, he never wanted to look another person in the face. But still, he was lonely. His friends were lonely, too. Only they were adults and were bored with grown-up children, looking for the specious comfort of reassuring eyes and mutual understanding. So now they told him in very clear late 20th century language that he had better clear out until he learned something about give and take and less demand. So he ran away screaming, thinking almost that it was his own idea. His friends were relieved to see him go, after all, and so went about their maturational therapy, hoping he would find somebody to play his little romance game with before he blew his top. Now he saw himself as a plunging charger carrying the lone knight to the holy grail he would find as soon as he left these adults to their stupid, idle pleasure.
With the utmost equilibrium of maturity, they went about their games, passing the mask, dancing the dance, and generally forgetting themselves quite admirably. They knew the morrow would come, bringing with it the guilt and pain of this tormentous night, but they were prepared to face it, prepared to stay asleep throughout the day, feeling and knowing as little as possible until night fell again and they could return to their precious toys and the complete ignorance of sleep. They were adult. But our little friend, Our little friend could not face the 20th century, so he went running. Only there was no place to run to. All the exits were covered. Everywhere he ran, there were people leering at him and saying, go, go, go. Soon he would be able to run no more. Soon he would fall down and dream. Further than that, he had no plan. But he could not fall down as long as there were people around. Soon he would fall. When he woke, he would run no more. He would either just over this hill. Surely then he would fall and sleep. Just over this hill. But no. For reasons we know nothing about, just at that moment, another man decided to blow the head off the next person he saw. Our friend was that person. He had only a few minutes to go. If he had only known, he could have lain down and dreamed. Then he would have passed from one dream into the next. If there were only more time, we could have the story on the unhappy young man who decided to blow Walter's brains out on his last day. We could follow him through his tribulations in the courthouse, could follow him into solitary confinement, could sit with him while his head was being shaven as he lay whimpering and alone, confused and defeated. We could walk beside him down the gray and sanitary prison corridor toward the mercy we offer to those of us who run amok. We could watch through the window as he strangles to death, trying to catch a breath to say, Mama. No, we have not enough time for all of the stories. Let us go on. Maybe you will see yourself.
Charles was very upset. For reasons we know nothing about, he had just murdered his landlady and her seven-year-old daughter. For hours, he'd been standing around in doorways, thinking it over and hearing in his despairing ears the thing his mother had said to him over and over again as a child. They'll hang you yet, Charles. So the early hours of the day passed, and he was no nearer to an understanding of this thing that had happened to him, whatever it might have been, that made him destroy something held sacred by the laws of society. But understanding or not, he now knew the penalties prescribed for his caprice. He realized also that it was possible that they might allow him the rest of his days to ponder his fate if he could only bring himself to surrender to the police now and confess to them his dilemma, his guilt, and bewilderment. Unfortunately, for reasons we know nothing about, the torture chambers on the way to absolution frightened Charles. And he decided that he did not cherish the thought of spending the rest of his days pondering a guilt he knew nothing about. Not knowing what to do, he at least resolved not to surrender, even though his arrest was imminent. He would take a walk and put the matter out of his mind as if he had the rest of his life to live, as if he had not virtually committed suicide back there in the night he could hardly remember. So he took his walk, enjoying the limitless scenes around him, as if he had the rest of his life to live, remembering that he had a right to live after all. But in the afternoon, he realized that his time was over and it was simply a matter of making a decision which he made. What does one think in one's last moment, he thought? What does one think? Does it suddenly sum itself up? Is there one picture or flashes? Yes, that is the final goodness of life. In that last moment, memory will be forced to operate in its true capacity. and the past will flow by before my eyes. Now all I have to do is to find a place where I can put myself in that last moment. Then he remembered a place he had often thought of before and he walked toward it, still enjoying his walk. With his last dime, he removed himself from the threat of red tape and embarrassment and the slate was already clean. Let us go on. The time grows shorter. All his life, John had wanted to be a poet. Then one day it had come to him that he had nothing to offer poetry, that poetry was in itself worthy of no offering. Then he had turned entertainer, clown, and he was brilliant at first. Where poetry had left him dead, his audience brought him to life, and he had learned how to make them laugh and cry. But now, he could no longer take the pain from his head by talking. Nothing meant anything, and anything meant nothing, and nothing 
meant nothing. So the only thing to do was to achieve sublime joy and then bow out at its peak before anyone knew he was gone. He gave them one more act, his friends and associates, and they watched him go, not daring to question him lest they interrupt his last words. Then he went through the door, and they all said, Goodbye, John. This was the greatest act ever. Really supreme, old boy. Bravo. One or two really thought he meant it. But the party went on. Someone else took the floor and John was forgotten. Applause went to the living and everybody hoped John would be all right. At dawn, they found him for the strangest suicide note anybody had ever seen. On his chest, they found tattooed a slow healing message. You know how neat I am. I couldn't mess up your living room with all that blood. There was no shell in the revolver, that was just a prop. I just want to thank you all for being the greatest audience I ever had. Let there be rejoicing. You have not seen yourself, you say. These people are all violent and suicidal. You are none of these. And yet you sit there quietly, awaiting the grand suicide of the human race, just as if you were not a part of humanity at all, just as if you had not asked for oblivion, just as openly as these poor frightened souls you see dissolving before your eyes. Dear friends, do not panic. There is very little time left. Be peaceful. Let us hurry. himself to the most hideous leper on the island as a nurse, a companion, and a lover, asking only that he be given the disease so that he might see whether it was possible for the leper to return that love 
when all too should become a leper in fact. If it was possible for the leper to return his friendship, then he would know that it was possible for a human being to know love. If it should prove otherwise, then he would not be surprised and rotting to the death he had chosen, he would rejoice to know that love, at least, was given to one human being, himself. Let there be rejoicing. Walking away from the sea in the eternal sleep, he walked back into the city, seeking passage to the islands of disease in the city hall. walk on a far way until the bursting sun of a death they offer him has come about and rendered him anonymous and invisible forever, along with all of his brothers who could never be brothers. For this, this was the world of the great disturbance which threw men against men and obliged men to hate. Threw men armed and bloody against their brothers, fighting to the death for the piece of bread his brother holds in his hand. In this great human perversion, he had learned that to live on earth, it was required that he hate and murder he could neither hate nor murder, but he wanted to live as all men did. There was no room for an innocent child trying to walk as quietly and as peacefully as possible through all the noise produced by strong men fighting for their favorite toys. He wondered if they knew just what a life they were living. He wondered if they knew just what had happened to human dignity when men could not look men in the eye, when there was no longer the slightest pride in being a human being, when one's personal meaning had suddenly narrowed itself to the least indulgence possible in the writhing fear and hate that possessed the minds of men on God's own earth. He will get about as far as the information desk. Then his time will be over, along with ours. gentlemen. We have asked you before to insert yourself into the cast. Now we ask you to write this story. Here is a character. Here is the most beautiful music on earth. Here are some pictures. What is happening?
He is a good boy. But somehow we feel that he is up to no good. Someone has hurt him. But he has got his ego back finally. And he will assert himself. Now. Someone is in the house. Why is he hesitating? Why is he going into the house? Now he will enter and destroy, perhaps? Listen, I know no more about the story than you do, but I do know that at this point, he is suddenly both blind and deaf. And he takes this as a message from somebody he had better accept as master, and he walks away from the house and its occupant. The person next to you is a leper. Poor, damned soul. Would you give him a drink of water and your blessing? Around the corner from you, strong men are dying of hunger. Most of the citizens of the earth are hungry. You are somehow aware of this, but how do you go about giving a glass of milk and a loaf of bread to a starving man, woman, or child in Mesopotamia. Well, never mind. It is too late.